Hi, this is Krista Walsh. Hey, this is Daniel Arthur Smith. Hey, this is Terry R. Hill. Hey, it's Josh Hayes, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with my friend Preston Lay. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. We do have a giveaway with this week's episode, but before I tell you about it, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, The Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. The Galactic Satori Chronicles, a thirst for revenge since one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancé's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. In a desire to better understand humans in order to destroy them, these aliens are projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, and in the process are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Fueled by emotions that the aliens will never understand, Asher bands together with a group of friends. These four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Asher takes the fight from Earth to an alien spaceship and then to the very planet of the enemy trying to destroy them. The Galactic Satori Chronicles can be found on Amazon where Book 1 Earth is only 99 cents and Book 2 Cron is $2.99. Head on over to Amazon and search for Galactic Satori Chronicles or head on over to Legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, we will include a link where you can find both Book 1 and Book 2 on Amazon. And now for the giveaway that I was telling you about. We are joined this week by author Juliana Spink Mills, and she would like to give one person the chance to win a signed copy of her book, Heartblade, the first book in the Blade Hunt Chronicles series. And that winner is also going to receive a set of character art postcards. What do you need to do in order to get registered for the giveaway? It's simple. Head on over to legendarium.com, find the show notes for this episode, and let us know what was your favorite part of the interview. It's as simple as that. Now enjoy our interview with Juliana Spink Mills. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. This week we have author uh, Juliana Spink Mills joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Not a problem at all. Um, Well, here at 30 Minute Author Interviews, we like to start each episode with a little segment that we call Two Truths and a Lie. I think I get them wrong most of the time, but I'm not 100% sure. I need to go back and count. Um, But do you have two truths and a lie that you can tell us? And then I will try to guess which one the lie is. I do. And since we're coming closer to summer, I thought I'd do some travel-based ones. So here we go. Okay. Uh, Number one, I've been to the top of Big Ben with a member of parliament. Number two, I've climbed Ayers Rock while visiting Australia for a scout jamboree. Number three, I twisted my ankle on the Santiago de Compostela Trail in Spain. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Well, based on what I know about you (laughs) from us just talking before, and then I listened to your interview with Keystroke Medium, um, I know that you're from England and that you lived in Brazil. So... For some reason, I'm going to say you're trying to throw me off just a little bit. And I'm going to say that the lie is you have been to the top of Big Ben, but it was not with a member of parliament. Uh, That's incorrect. Dang it. (laughs) Dang it. In fact, because members of the public can't go up Big Ben unless they're escorted by a member of parliament. Oh, I did not know that. No, I didn't either until I actually had the opportunity to go up. Nice. So how's the view from up there? Uh, uh, it's not so much the view. It's being inside. Um, and then the, the we were inside Big Ben when the clock struck. Oh, okay. And then you have to be really, really quiet because they broadcast it live on the BBC. So if you say anything while it's striking the hour and recording, I mean, you're basically going to be all over the world. So <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It would be like the best podcast ever. <laughs> That's right. You should uh, 
get up there again and be like, buy my book. It's Heartblade. <laughs> that, that would be awesome. So which one was the lie? The twisting the ankle on the trail. I've never done the Santiago de Compostela trail, although I've heard really great things about it and I'd love to do it someday. Oh, okay. So, so you have been to a scout jamboree you said in Australia? Yes. How did you end up uh, in Australia for, for a jamboree? Uh, well, in Brazil, where I grew up, uh, scouting is co-ed. So I was a Cub Scout and a Girl Scout. And um, every four years, there, there's an international jamboree where scouts from all over the world get together. And I went when I was 15 with a group of scouts from Brazil. That is interesting. So so in Brazil, you don't have like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. It's just scouts and it's combined? Uh, kind of. We have Girl Guides, which is like the American Girl Scouts. Okay. And we have, so we have the guide movement. And we also have the scout movement. And the scout movement itself is co-ed. Oh, okay. So you have Girl Scouts and Girl Guides. I was a scout. Oh, okay. Very. I'm, wow, that's interesting. Okay. I've heard of, uh, here we have, uh, in the Boy Scouts, we have something called Venture Scouts. Um, and that's that's boy-girl combined. But it's mainly, I guess, older, older I think scouts. Venture Scouts is from 15 up or something yeah, like that. I was going to say 15. I was thinking 14, but maybe it is 15. So, Okay. Yeah, I did Venture Scouts once I finished and got my Eagle. Then I did some Venture stuff um, just to stay active a little bit longer. So that is cool. I would love to go to Australia sometime. I want to go see an Aussie Rules football game. I th- or, uh, yeah, Aussie. They say Aussie. Sorry. Aussie Rules football game. They're so fun to watch on television. Um, I have to know, since you lived in Brazil, did you follow soccer much when you were living down there? Or or do they say football? Yeah, I'm not a very good Brazilian, or, or I guess I'm not a very good <laughs> English woman either because, you know, with the soccer. But uh, I don't like coffee, and I don't really follow football unless it's, I mean, soccer, sorry, unless it's like the World Cup because, of course, that's a huge deal in Brazil. Basically, the country shuts down for the World Cup. Yeah. Seriously, they'll let you out of work early to go home and catch the game. Nice. Sometimes schools cancel. Uh, like the school day because there's a game in the middle of the day or something. So it's this huge deal. Uh, that is awesome. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of fun. Like Everybody decorates everything in yellow and green. It's it's this real sort of festive Man, feel. Man, I would – oh, that would be so awesome. I, I would love to go to a World Cup game. Um, I watch it at, every time it comes on, though. Of course, and then I follow just soccer throughout the year. Um, but I, I had to ask since you've been to Brazil and you were – Raised in England, so <laughs> two two soccer powerhouses. Definitely. Um, well, no, for- the soccer fan at home is my husband. I just kind of follow up <laughs> a little bit, but he tells me who's won, and you know. There we go. Um, well, for my listeners that might not know who you are or what you do, can you kind of tell my listeners who you are and what you do? Okay, I'm Juliana. I was born in England, uh, but I moved to Brazil when I was eight. My mom's Brazilian. And I lived most of my life in Brazil. Uh, a couple of about four years ago, we moved to the states. So I live in Connecticut now. I write science fiction and fantasy, mostly middle grade and YA. Um, let's see. Uh, I work as a translator as well, a Portuguese English translator, but mostly nonfiction stuff. I don't actually. I don't think I've ever done something fiction. It's all sort of uh, coffee table books and academic papers and stuff like that. Uh, which is actually a really good, um, it's really good for, for sort of get sharpening your editor's eye because when you're translating something, you pick up all the mistakes and you pick up all the, you know, everything that's wrong with a, with, with like a paragraph or something, cause you've got to basically pick it apart and rewrite it in a different language. So it's actually a really good, really good practice for writing. Okay. Yeah. So I'm the author of Heartblade, which is the first in the Blade Hunt Chronicle series. It's a young adult urban fantasy series. This is my first published book, uh, and book two should be out later this year sometime. Um, so you said you've only been here in the States for four years. Um, what, what brought y'all here to America? Uh, my husband's job. Have you enjoyed it so far, the four years? Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, well, we lived in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is a huge sort of – it's bigger than New York. It's, it's a huge city, and it kind of got to the point where we were – 
were kind of tired of the whole traffic and pollution and violence and all that. And it was just nice to get, I mean, it's a fantastic city. There's a lot of great stuff there, but it was nice to get a break from that for a bit. And I mean, we lived up near Hartford. It's pretty, pretty suburban. There's a lot of green uh, and it's just nice. It's peaceful. Okay. Sounds good. Well, um, so, so is Heartblade, um, the first story that you've, you've put out? Cause I know that, it, uh, it has listed on Amazon that you're in uh, two anthologies, an anthology called Journeys, and then another one called Aliens. Um, so is Heartblade the first thing that you, you published? Uh, no, but everything kind of came out more or less together. Aliens was first. That was at the end of 2016. Uh, then Heartblade and Journeys actually published the same week. So everything's <laughs> been sort of <laughs> all at once. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, for my readers that might not know uh, what Heartblade is about, can you give them the book blurb on what Heartblade is about? Sure. Well, Blade Hunt Chronicles, uh, basically the series um, is is about – it's about a prophecy that of about four <laughs> – sorry. That was fine. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I can't speak anymore. I forgot how to speak. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it hinges around prophecy with four swords – that have kind of mystical properties and are supposed to lead the world towards a new apocalypse or basically save the world. The, the four swords kind of relate to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, so the first book, Heartblade, is about clearly the Heartblade, which is one of these four swords. And it's basically Del's story. Del is a half-demon, and she refuses the the to accept the, the kind of destiny that she's supposed to be following with her demon pack and all that. She doesn't want that. So she basically, she runs away and sets a whole bunch of things in motion. And eventually she gets tangled up with the Heartblade prophecy. Okay. So, so Heartblade's the name of one of the swords and you said there's four swords. So can we assume that it's going to be a four series book then? Exactly. Yes. The second book will be Nightblade. Um, so you said that one's going to be out a little bit later this year. Do you have a, do you have a timeline you're looking at getting that one out? Uh, probably, probably around September if everything goes right. Okay. I mean, I'm working on revisions now, so it's written, it's ready to, almost ready to go. So, so do you hope to have the whole series done by next year? So that way you put out four books in a, a two year period? Ideally, yeah, that's what I'd like. I mean, I have book three all planned out already, and I know pretty much everything that has to happen in book four. So there we go. So the, we'll, we'll uh, I guess let's talk about this series as a whole for a minute. Um, why did you decide to write this series as a young adult series instead of an adult series? Or I've always wanted to write kids books in general i started off actually the first few things i wrote the not published but uh were all middle grades so for uh kids maybe eight to twelve that sort of age group uh, and and then i moved up to the ya sort of segment which get, gives me a little bit more room to play with right you get a little bit of a longer longer story to play with and you know you can sort of deepen certain certain types of themes and darken it a little bit. Uh, But basically this is what I've always wanted to write. Okay. Um, So, so have you been a reader of middle grade and and young adult stories for most of your life then? I'll pretty much read everything and anything. I mean, I'll read middle grade books and I'll read George R. R. Martin. I can, you know, I'll read completely, you know, I, I'm not picky as long as it's a good story. Okay, so you read anything, but you just like to write the young adult and middle grade stories. Yeah, I do. I always say it's because I'm probably 12 years old at heart. So uh, (laughs) there we go. (laughs) And anytime you try and write something like really serious and adult, and you know, everybody says, "Oh, this is too light and fluffy. This sounds like it's written for 15 year olds." I'm like, "Okay, well, you know, stick with my strengths." (laughs) (laughs) Fine, I'll just stick with my young adult then. That's funny. Um, so I've. I've seen Heartblade described as urban fantasy, but then I've also he- heard it called young adult fantasy. Um, is there a category you see it fitting into better, or is it a combination of both urban fantasy and fantasy? But technically, it's urban fantasy. Okay. Uh, but with young adults, I've, I've noticed that, that descriptions seem to be a little broader 
So while with, with adult, I mean, we're all about the subgenres and it's, you know, it's urban fantasy, it's uh, whatever, cyberpunk. It's, you know, we're all about the, the, the you know, the smaller subgenres. But with, with young adult, it tends to be, oh, this is fantasy. This is dystopian. They seem to be kind of broader uh, categories. So I often just describe it as young adult fantasy, but it is in fact an urban fantasy novel. It's set in present day Connecticut. Uh, and you know, I mean, there are swords in it, but there are also cell phones and SUVs and things like that. So, okay, well, there we go. So it's sometimes it seems like when I'm going through books a million or Barnes and Noble and looking at the young adult section, they all seem to kind of follow the mold, I guess, for what's popular. You know, you had the Hunger Games, and at first it was Twilight, got really big, so everybody did sparkly vampires or some kind of vampire story. And then you had Divergent come out, uh, Hunger Games and Divergent kind of at the same time and got Maze big. Maze Runner. And, Maze, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so did you have – it, it sounds like this doesn't follow what is popular right now in young adult. Did you have a hard time – writing the story was it hard to not do something that's kind of already out there or was it was this just a story you're like i know i need to write this and so you were going to write it regardless well one of the key bits of advice i always hear is that um the whole uh, publishing world unless you're unless you're you're completely you're an indie publisher and you're on your own terms and you're on your own timeline and you can you know get a book out there really really fast it's not much use trying to write to trends because by the time, I mean, for example, if you're going to go with a big publisher, I have a couple of friends who published with, with big, you know, really big publishing houses. And um, it takes a good couple of years for your book to get out there. So if you're trying to write, to, and that's not including time spent querying an agent, time on sp- submission, I'm talking actual time from when you sign a contract with a publishing house, right? It's okay. a slow process. So what I always hear is don't write to trends because, you know, by the time, you, you know, you get something published, it's, it might be long gone or, you know, just write what seems to be in, what you're interested in, basically. Okay. And I don't know, the story was kind of sitting there in my head and I figured, well, let's go with it and see what happens. Start your own trend. Um, so th- this book is actually put out by Woodbridge Press, which is it's a small indie press, correct? Correct. How did you? Um, how did they find out about your story, or did you submit it to them, or what, what was that whole process of getting involved with a small indie press? Well, uh, so I wrote Heartblade, and I sent it out to a few friends who do beta reading for me. You know, we sort of beta read each other's books. Which, uh, for anybody who doesn't know what beta reading is, it's basically you give somebody your your manuscript and they read through it and critique it and, you know, we'll do exchanges and I'll read theirs and so forth. So anyway, it had been beta read by a few people. I had tried querying it and I got feedback from a couple of agents who said, oh no, you know, vampires and angels and demons and stuff. Nobody wants that anymore. We're not interested. So I was like, oh, okay. I kind of like my story, but never mind. So I kind of stuck it in a virtual drawer and went off to write other stuff the way you do and just sort of left it there and figured, you know, well, one day I'll figure out what to do with it because I still like the plot. I like the story. Uh, and then uh, Nathan Heistad, who owns Woodbridge Press, happened to have been one of my beta readers. Oh, nice. And when he decided to open Woodbridge, he got in touch with me and said, listen, I'm ready to to publish a novel and I'd really like it to be Heartblade. What, have you still got Heartblade? Have you sold it? What have you done with it? And I said, no, it's still here if you're interested in having another look. So, yeah. <laughs> I guess the story just stuck with him and, you know, he yeah, really they, liked it. Yeah, there you go. Um, do you have um, an excerpt from either Heartblade or or book two or whatever that, that you can read to – uh, our listeners, so they can kind of see what your series sounds like? Okay, I do, yes. Not from book two yet, because okay. that's still being revised, and, you know, I don't want to read anything that is might train, might still, you know, change. Okay. But I'm going to read a little piece from the second chapter of Heartblade, which is where I introduce Ash. Ash is 17. He's a sentinel, which are uh, people descended from angels, basically. Okay. And this is a scene where he's sort of on a ride along with with some of the older sentinels because he's in training to 
he's an apprentice. He's in training, basically. So okay. um, this is a scene where they're basically they're hunting down a rogue vampire. The SUV rocketed along the dirt track right on the motorbike's trail. The surrounding trees were a dark blur in the night, lit only by their headlights. Ash realized he was holding his breath and let it out in one big exhale. Becca heard and chuckled. Prentices, she said, shaking her head. So darn cute. Hey, don't worry, kid. We're in good hands. Your old man's the best in the business. You don't get to be scion of the New England chapter of Sentinels for nothing. Ash would have protested, said he wasn't worried, but it would have been a lie. Becca would have known. They all would. You couldn't lie to a sentinel. Instead, he gritted his teeth and tugged at his bulletproof vest. The borrowed body armor he wore felt too tight across his shoulders. His whole chest was too tight. Becca drew closer to the stuttering motorbike, still trailing acrid clouds of smoke. The trees opened suddenly into a vista of dark fields, and Becca accelerated, throwing the car off the road. They ripped through the tall grass, them slashing viciously at the sides of the SUV. There was a sudden impression of approaching buildings, and then the side of the SUV hit the bike hard. The bike went down in a tumbling crash, the engine's growl cutting out abruptly as the vampire fell head over heels to land on his back. The SUV skidded to a stop, high beams raking the, raking the black. The vampire scrambled to his feet and took off, Deacon in pursuit with his sword over his shoulder as Ash leaned over his cousin to watch. Becca snagged her hunting rifle from the back of the car and turned to Ash and Jordan, still inside. Well, you here to learn or what? So yeah, that's a little little taster. I do like my action scenes. It's one of my favorite things to write. That's that's where I was going to kind of go next with this. So when I heard uh, your interview on Keystroke uh, Medium, there was, uh, y'all talked about something during the interview that I wanted to touch on for my listeners that maybe haven't heard that interview. Um, We found out in that interview that you ended up taking long sword lessons. Um, Can you tell us the story on why you even started looking into taking long sword lessons and are you still doing it today? Well, I have a lot of sword fighting scenes in Heartblade and the Blade Hunt Chronicles in general, obviously Blade Hunt, right? Um, And I I mean, you, you watch things on YouTube and you get a good feel for things, but I found out that there's a place just 25 minutes from home that actually has long sword lessons. So I figured, you know, I'd go and do one lesson and see what it actually looked like up close and personal. Uh, and it was fabulous fun. And I'm still there over a year later. Uh, in fact, my instructor, Christopher Valley, um, was one of the people who revised scenes for me for Heartblade. He went through all my fight scenes for me, which was wonderful. So it's kind of turned into a collaboration in a way. That is awesome. Now you got your instructor into writing. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. There you go. And I mean, a couple of the other instructors, they kind of acted out a few of the steps I wanted to include in the book so I could check exactly how the movements worked. And so, yeah. Uh, but most of all, it's just, it's just so much fun. It really is. It's, you know, it's worth trying. If, if, if you have anything like that near you, it's worth trying just one lesson for the heck of it because it's really fun. Um, do you only do longsword, or do you do other uh, weapons as well at the class? We, I mean, we have a little bit of other things. We have a little bit of, of rondel dagger, which is the kind of dagger knights would have used in medieval times. We do a little bit of, of poleaxe and a bit of uh, medieval wrestling, but the bulk of it is, is longsword. Uh, what makes medieval wrestling different from... Uh... I guess the wrestling they they do today. Uh, uh, I don't think I know how to answer that. I imagine the movements are all very different because they're designed for people wearing armor. Okay. Oh, okay. But I really don't know how to answer that. Um. So is is long sword one of your favorite weapons that you have learned to use in that class, or is there a different weapon now that you prefer, uh, or that you like more? No, I like I like longsword. I I definitely it's you know it's, uh, something that I enjoy working with. Uh, the dagger is a little too up close and personal for me. And although I do in book two, I do have a little bit of poleaxe, uh, which I think I'm going to bring into book three a lot more. So because uh, that's 
that's a quite an interesting weapon. You can do a lot with the with the pole axe, you know. Rather than you can, I mean, you can thrust, you can hook, you can, <laughs> you right. can do all sorts of interesting moves. <laughs> um, do you watch the show Forge by Fire on History Channel? No, I don't. Is that a good one? Oh, you you might like it. it uh, the competition is it starts out with four people and. Um, normally the first round that they're all competing for, I think it's $10,000. Um, and the first round they have to make, uh, normally it's, it's a knife of their choice. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, you know, your knife has to be so long without the tang and then with the tang, which is the handle for those that don't know, um, you know, your knife can only be so long. Um, and then, so the first round shaping your knife and get it all ready this, and then they eliminate somebody, the second round is finishing the knife and putting a handle on it. Um, and then they test the weapons and then they eliminate somebody. And then those, the two that are left then have five days. They get to go back home to their home forge and they get to, uh, they, they reveal the big weapon that they want them to make. Um, and I believe they have done the long sword. I forget what season it was on, but I believe they've, that they have done the long sword. Um, I've learned about some weapons I didn't know about from that show. I think one of my favorites is called the Hunga Munga. It was a, that was a cool weapon to watch them make. But uh, if you like that kind of stuff, you probably like the show. It's a neat show. Yeah, I'm gonna look it up definitely. But def, I mean, I think it's it's if you know if you're writing books that have weapons in it, it's it's probably a good idea to try and 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 at least see in person what these things look like. Because for example. Uh, I had all these sword scenes, and when I actually picked up uh, a long sword, I realized uh, that several things. I'd have to change a lot of the fight scenes because, I mean, it's in the name, long sword, right? But mm. weirdly enough, you don't realize just how long that thing is until you pick one up and you're waving it around, and you realize that you know there are certain movements you can't do because the darn thing is so big. So, um, so, so, did you have any scenes that you had to actually get rid of? Any fight scenes because you're like, yeah, this can't happen with a long sword at all. I had to adapt a few scenes, definitely. Okay. I rewrote several of them. Uh, I got rid of of a scene where one of my characters was ca- carrying his sword on, on, like, on one of those cool back uh, kind of sheath things you see in in on TV shows sometimes. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, okay, yeah, that's you, you can do that with Deadpool swords. You can't do that with a long sword. <laughs> that's right. So <laughs> that's right. Um, so so, how long is the average uh, long sword? Well, the one one of the ones that's described in Heartblade is is forty eight inches. Uh, the one I have is about fifty inches, I think. Oh wow! Okay, I was thinking four feet, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure. Um, so, so do you, com- do you do competitions or do you mainly just go to the classes? No, I, I mean, I have, I have, uh, friends in, in class who do go to competitions. Okay. I don't because I'm going to be perfectly honest. I, I, I'm a little, I don't, I don't like the actual, like the actual sparring, but so much, <laughs> uh, I'm not great at thinking, thinking fast. I can do the drills. I could do the one-on-one, like the short drills and stuff like that, but the actual sparring, yeah, not so much. I prefer to watch. Right. So you said that you're currently doing your revisions on book two. Um, and Nathan said that we might like to kind of hear about your revision process and how you go about revising the book. Well, Heartblade was a little different because, it, you know, it was a first book and I didn't have any obligations at the time. So I, I took my time with the first draft. I rewrote it a million times. I tweaked it here and there and before it, you know, before it went to Woodbridge and all that. But with uh, Nightblade, I think it's probably easier for me to talk because now I'm working to a publishing time frame. Uh, okay. So I write a first draft, which is reasonably pretty complete as far as plot goes. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people who write very bare bones on the first draft. Mine is pretty complete. Uh, and while I'm writing it, I'm getting feedback from my critique group. And I'm also keeping a list of editing notes of my own because, you know, you sort of halfway through, you'll be like, oh, this is a really cool twist. But then I need to go back and include this and this and that to make it work. And so I keep a like a running batch of notes, which by the end, I think was like five pages of, of illegible scribbles. Uh, which I then have to decipher. 
so after I've done the first draft, I rewrite the first, rework the first draft with all my own editing notes and feedback from my critique group. And then that, that goes to, so that, uh, that went to a couple of people who, who have beta read it for me. And, um, then I get all sorts of revision notes back. So this is where the, the big, um, kind of fine tuning process starts, the kind of fleshing things out. Uh, so uh, this is where I am now. I'm kind of going through all the notes I've received and notes I've made myself since then because, of course, you know, things keep cropping up that you're like, oh, I should have included this, I should have included that. Oh, he needs to have another panic attack, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now I'm about to start uh, – probably a full rewrite, I think, is probably easiest um, rather than just adding bits here and there. I find it easier to just go through the whole thing from beginning to end. Oh, okay. And just rewrite the whole story. Yeah. Okay. I mean, obviously there are bits that I'm just going to be copy pasting, but, Mm -hmm. um, there are bits that, that it's just easier to rewrite entirely. And, and, you know, cause this is where you're, you're adding layers basically. Okay. Especially with characters and, and, you know, because I, I tend to be more plot oriented, uh, first time round, and then when I get into all the revisions and all that, that's when I kind of, fl- you know, work the characters more. Um, so, so after you finish the, uh, this revision process, um, what's your steps in writing then? Then it goes back to Woodbridge and, um, and I have some, uh, somebody else who's going to, who's sort of fr- fresh eyes. I'm, I'm saving them for, for, you know, once the revision's over, uh, so it goes back to Woodbridge, and um, then it comes back to me if I've got anything else to change. And after that, it goes to copy editing and proof- proofreading and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, we did have a fan question I wanted to make sure that we got to, and I'm I'm probably going to say their Twitter name wrong, so I am sorry in advance for butchering your name. Uh, is it uh, Josie BD at Josie B. Wright? Um, Josepity, yes. Josepity, there we go. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> um, they Joe's, were like, a ter- Joe's a terrific author in her own right. She's a she's a great science fiction oh, and she? fantasy author. Yes. Okay. Um, is she young adult as well, or is she more adult? She writes a lot of things that fit in the crossover zone that have both teen and adult characters. Okay. Uh, but more of an adult writer, I'd say. Okay. Um. Their, their question was, they want to know uh, what Trunk story uh, you have. Um, I'm just going to read what she wrote. She said, I want to know what Trunk story is the one uh, Jew most wants wants to go back to and why. I have several Trunk things, but I don't really consider them Trunk. They're kind of on hold because there are things that I want to go back to, but it's not quite the right moment right now. Um I definitely have a couple of middle grade projects that I wrote a while back when I was still starting out and still sort of learning the ropes. And I've, at the moment, I'm focusing on YA, so that's definitely on hold for now. But there is one middle grade project in particular that I really want to go back to. Uh, it's a portal fantasy. Uh, but like I said, at the moment, I'm focusing on YA, so it'll be a while before I, I can turn to middle grade, I think. Okay. So one question that we always like to ask our listeners um, it's, it's a not very serious question, but we're kind of known for it. It is a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say? And why is he here? He says, you forgot your towel. And then he melts. Cause clearly this ship's infinite improbability drive has been on too long. <laughs> and if you don't get that, you should go and read the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. <laughs> there we go. You're welcome. <laughs> works oh that's a good answer um so where can our listeners go if they would like to learn more about you and your stories that you have written i have a i have a blog which i try to update reasonably regularly and it's got all sorts of information about heartblade and the blade hunt chronicles there uh as well as a quiz you can take if you're interested in that kind of thing to tell you if you're an angel or a demon or a vampire and all sorts of things oh, that's uh, awesome. and <laughs> yeah i've i've I found that that there's this this quizzer app thing where you can make your own your own quizzes. 
So when Heartblade launched, I thought it'd be fun to have like a quiz I could share around. So I actually, I wrote that one myself. It was a lot of fun. Oh, nice. I recommend doing that kind of, it's, it's a lot of fun if you want to go on Quizzer. They have all the, all the setup and you just create your own thing, basically. That is uh, awesome. But anyway, uh, you can find all that on my blog. It's jspinkmills.com. And that's, uh, just, uh, that's just the letter J? J, yep. Jspinkmills.com. J Juliana Spink Mills, yep. Jspinkmills.com. Well, I'm going to have to go and take that quiz because I want to know what I am. So once we get done, I'm going to go find out what I am. Um, before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with the listeners? Advice, definitely, for both writing and life. I think don't give up. If there's something that you, you want to do that you're passionate about, don't give up because sometimes things can take years to happen and and you just have to stick with it. And, you know, not let anything put you off or anybody put you off. There we go. That is great advice. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on this uh, this week's episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. It has been. That's all the time that we have for this week's episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope you tune in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for another great author interview. And head on over to the show notes at legendarium.com. In the show notes, you're going to find the giveaway where you can win a signed copy of Heartblade, the first book in Juliana's Blade Hunt Chronicles, and you'll also win a set of character art postcards. Also in the show notes, you're going to find the link to our sponsor, the Galactic Satori Chronicles. Check them out and let them know that you heard about them right here on 30-Minute Author Interviews. And don't miss another episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and also on YouTube. Never miss another episode. I would also like to thank a few of our Patreon supporters. I would like to thank Nick Breaker, Diane S. Loftus, Third Scribe, and Maggie Stewart-Grant. They're supporting 30-minute author interviews through Patreon. They're also receiving the Patreon-only podcast, 10 Questions With. Visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30-minute author interviews as well. And until next time, guys, remember to stay legendary. Oh, screw that one up. Blooper reel.